exercise uh, material doubts. This was a last topic related to unit one. Page 11 first. Page 11, protein B and C. Question number 14, uh, show that the spring constant show that the spring constant is about 30 Newton per millimeter. Spring constant is basically force divided by extension. This is a graph for the length. So each box is representing like five boxes equals to five. So each box is representing one. So it is in between. So it is starting with 2.5. And you can take any of the value because it's a straight line and you can take the last value. So that is 30. So by the force, how much it has extended from 2.5 to 30. So it is extended by 27.5, but that is in centimeter. We have to convert into meter. We divide by 100. So that is equals to 0 0.275 meter. So 0 0.275 is an extension. And uh, how much force is there? We started the force from zero till eight. So the force applied is equals to eight. To get the spring constant K, that is force divided by extension. So we have the force which we applied that is eight and extension is equals to 0 0.275. So force divided by extension will give us the value for the K or the spring constant. So it is F, uh, like eight divided by 0 0.275, which is equals to 29.09 Newton per meter or as we have to show, it's about 30, so that is 29.09. In part C, when a student is removing the mass of a spring, accidentally, uh, real, uh, accidentally release when its length is 23. The spring flies off into air, show that the energy stored in the spring is about 0 0.6 joules when the length is 23 centimeter. So the Formula to calculate the energy stored in the spring is equals to half force into extension. So same way uh, we will work out because uh, either we can use how much force is applied, like force, the maximum force which is applied and then extension. So it is released when it is 23. So originally, this is a, a length because we need extension, not the length. And when it is 23, this is a force applied. So the force applied equals to 5.8 Newton. And how much of this extension is there? So starting again from 2.5 and, and 23 centimeter, he released. So how much extension is there? 23, point, uh, 23 minus 22.5, so it will be 20.5 centimeter. We convert it to meters, so it will be zero point, as we divide by 100, so it will be equal to 0 0.205 meter. So we have the extension, we have the force, so we just use the formula half force into extension. So area under the graph, give a, you can work out with area under the graph or you can also work out but this is not starting from origin, so it's better use half force into extension. The next part. Um, Calculate the maximum height the spring could reach above its point of release, the mass. So here what we'll consider, we'll use a conservation of energy like the elastic strain energy equals to gravitational potential energy. So what answer we'll get in the previous one, we have to show that energy is about 0.6. So we'll get about 0 0.6, 0 0.59, I think. When we use a formula half force into extension, 
that will give us energy stored. So the what, what happened, elastic strain energy turned into potential energy. So here it will have elastic strain energy equals to gain in potential energy. Potential energy is MGH and elastic strain energy you will use 0 0.59. And uh, M is a mass that is given in gram, so don't forget to convert into kilogram. G is a gravity 9.8, so you can work out the maximum height it will reach. So that was question 14, part B and C. Next is it's page 19. In question 24, page 19, question 24, a silk is a natural protein fiber which produced by spider in the silk worm and it's, it is a material of a high tensile strength. Means uh, we need greater amount of force to uh, stretch the graph, give the stress strain curve up to a point, a silk produced by a spider in a silk by a worm. State what is meant by the high tensile strength. You have to write uh, definition of a high tensile strength, like maximum amount of force or greater force is needed to produce a small extension. Then spider uses a silk to build a web to catch insects. Use a graph, explain how the properties of a spider silk uh, make more suitable than a silk worm by building a web uh, to catch an insect. First thing, when you're comparing, as you can see the slope, the gradient of a spider, the stress strain graph, the gradient is more than the, uh, the web produced by a silk worm. So it means this will have a high young modulus or you can also say it will have a greater So it will have a higher young modulus or we need great, or, uh, greater stiffness, you can also say, or more force is needed to produce a small extension or increase in length. That is one thing. Then the second, the deformation. Uh, this part, like the plastic region, when you check, so it has a greater area under the graph. So, First, like how the marks are distributed, when you compare the slope or the gradient, the one which is steeper will have a higher young modulus. So spider web is having a higher young modulus than a silk worm. And another thing, large area under the graph, large area under the graph means it is tough because like greater area under the graph, it can deform uh, before it like greater deformation or greater uh, undergo greater plastic deformation before it breaks. So you area under the graph shows that the spider web is have it's tougher as compared to a silk worm. Another thing you can also say high tensile strength, like or a breaking stress stress. You can also say higher breaking stress for a spider uh, web as compared to a silk worm. This this value of the stress, the maximum value of a stress is known as the breaking stress. Which so greater force is needed to break the spider web as compared to a silk worm. So these are the points you have to uh, mention. Use a graph to determine the Young's modulus of a spider silk for a, a small stress. So whenever the question is about the Young's modulus, you will always use only the area of uh, like the gradient of the part from the beginning, like when it is constant. When it starts to curve, don't use that part. So we just have to use a, a stress and strain. That will give us the Young's because stress divided by strain gives us a Young's modulus. So stress is each is representing like uh, 20. So each is representing four. So 44, eight, uh, 52. This will be about 56. 
So 56 mega, 10 power 6, divided by each is 10 power, so each is 0 0.005. So this will be 0 0.004, 0 0.04 will be there. This will be 0 0.32. So you just divide and you will get the Young's modulus as the Young's modulus is space divided by space. Don't forget to substitute the unit of the axis. Like if it is mega, mega means 10 power 6. So when you are calculating a value, you should use that in your calculation as well. If you just write 56 divided by 0 0.04, your answer will be considered as wrong. As you did not use a prefix of the axis. You have to use a prefix. Then an insect flies into a spider web, become attached to a single thread, which create a tension in a thread, which is 580 micro uh, Newton. The thread extended approximately 3% of the original value, calculate the radius. So in the previous part, we calculate the Young's modulus. So we have the Young's modulus, which is stress over Spain. Or Young's modulus, it's denoted, Young's modulus usually, do, it's, in the book, it's denoted by E. So Young's modulus is force divided by, stress is force divided by extension and uh, change in length over original length is the strain. So delta L divided by L. When we simplify this formula, it will be F L divided by delta L and A. So first, we, we have the Young's modulus in the previous part. We have the force. Now, about 3% of original length extension. So what is the 3% of original length? So 3%, like 3 divided by 100. So extension, the change in length is 3% of original length. So 3%, when we convert into a fraction, it will be 3 divided by 100. Or we can say the change in length is 0 0.03 of the original length. So in place of length, it will be L. But change in length will be 0 0.03 L. Because 3%, we convert into decimal. And uh, area, so L will cancel with L. The cell will cancel with L. And we'll work out the area. So area is equals to F divided by E into 0 0.03. So we have force, but don't forget to convert into units. So it will be 580 into 10 power minus 6. So we'll have this uh, forces there. We have the extension, uh, the Young's modulus from the previous answer will get the area. After getting the area, area of cross section is pi r square. So we have pi, like area is equals to pi r square. So area divided by pi is equals to r square. Or we take a root. So under root, area divided by pi will give us a value for radius. Is it uh, clear this part? Then next is... Page 19, uh, it's page 26. Okay. In this question, a washing line has a negligible mass and initially it is horizontal. A student investigate the effect of hanging mass at the midpoint. Uh, add to our diagram the forces. So there will be a weight acting downward and a tension will be there. The direction of a tension is always to pull. A mass of 1.1 kilogram is hung at a midpoint so that the downward uh, vertical force on the line is about 11 Newton. So we just have to calculate the weight of, because weight is equal to mass into gravity. So weight is equals to mass into gravity, W equals to mg. 
the mass is 1.10 and the gravity is 9.81. So when we multiply, we'll get the downward force. That will be Newton. <clears throat> the force pull the midpoint down at a distance of uh, 48.5 centimeters. Show that the angle, uh, uh, show that the line is at an angle of 84 to the vertical. And length of the washing line when horizontal is 9.6. Here, here we will use a trigonometric uh, ratios. This length was 9.6 meter. And this was pulled downward. by for only and that is 48.5 centimeters so unit should be same you have to convert into meter like this vertically it pulled out 48.5 centimeter we have to show that the line is at an angle of 84 to the vertical so if we have a vertical like we can show this, this angle to be 84 84 degrees we have to show. So first thing, we'll use a trigonometric ratio. Uh, this comp this will be the hypotenuse. The one which is with an angle, this will be base and opposite, that will be perpendicular. It's making a right angle triangle. So for our, this right angle triangle, we have the base and we also have the perpendicular. So if you have the base and perpendicular, we'll use a tangent theta, trigonometric ratio, because tangent theta, because tangent theta is equal to perpendicular divided by base. So tangent theta, the perpendicular is, this one is a perpendicular, which is 9.6, divided by, but th this whole is 9.6. Uh, when it is moved down, so we, we need just half of it, because as I mentioned, the horizontal length was 9.6, so this will be half of 9.6, that's why it will not be total 9.6, it will be half of it, so 4.8. So this part will be 4.8. And divided by, uh, this one is in centimeter, we have to convert into meter, so 0 0.485. When we divide, so theta is equals to tan inverse. Uh, 4.8 divided by 0 0.485, so this will give us around 84.2 degrees. That is the angle with vertical. Show that the tension in the line is less than 60 Newton. So how we can show that the tension in the line is less than 60 Newton? The weight is acting downward, which we already calculated, and there's a tension from both sides, and this angle uh, with the vertical was 84, or 84.2. This was 84.2 degrees, and this is also 84.2 degrees. This tension example, we say T, this is also T, and the weight is W. So the component of the tension will balance with the weight. So the component of a tension which is with an angle, like this is a tension with an angle, so this will be T cosine theta. So it will be T cosine 84.5. And there's also another tension T is there, so that will also have a component uh, in a vertical. So there will be two, like T cosine theta for the left-hand side spring and T cosine theta for the right-hand side spring. So total upward force will be twice of it. So it will be 2t cosine uh, 84.5 is equals to weight. If we need the tension, so tension will be equal to weight divided by 2 cosine 84.2 degrees. And weight we already calculated in the previous part. So we just have to uh, substitute the values. Uh, th that will be about like after substituting the value for the mass gravity, uh, this will come out around 53.4 newtons. Is it uh, clear this part?
Then the washing line is uh, the washing line stretches so that the total length is now uh, nine nine point eight four seven meter. Calculate the strain. Strain is change in length over original length. So originally the washing line was given in the beginning of the question. The washing line was or uh, length of nine point six, and now it is. 9.847. So how much change in length is there? That will be 9.847 minus 9.6. That is change in length divided by original length. So change in length divided by original length will give us the strain, which is uh, when you subtract this, it will be 0.247. So like this is 0.247 divided by 9.6. So this will be 0 0.0026 or 0 point, uh, 0 0.026. And strain does not have any unit, so you don't write a unit for this. Then calculate the value of the Young's modulus. So if you need the Young's modulus, how we calculate the Young's modulus? Young's modulus is stress over strain. That's how we calculate the Young's modulus. So, and stress is force divided by area. We calculated the total force, uh, the cross-sectional area, like to, Separately, you can find the stress. Stress is force divided by area and strain is change in length over original length. So, as we calculated here, show that the tension in the line, this, this value was a force. So, we have the force. We have the cross-sectional area. This is like, uh, this one is the... Superscript, like it is 6.6 .6 into raised power minus 6, that's area. So force divided by area will give us the stress. And strain we calculated here. <coughs> Sorry. So we divide both of them. So stress divided by strain, we'll get the Young's modulus. Only substitution is there. That's why I did not calculate. You just have to substitute in the formula. Uh, next is page 41 and page 41 of uh, question 49 part C. Okay. A student eats a packet of a crisp and then uses uh, the exercise device. The energy contained in a packet of a crisp is about 540 kilojoules. This is the energy which is present in the crisp. And uh, using it after uh, eating, using it for uh, the energy from this. So the energy content, uh, the during the exercise, the energy is converted and like during exercise, this energy is converted and 25% of it is a mechanical. Like out of total, only 25% is useful. The student extends the device fully 15 times in one minute. An accurate value of the work done for fully extended device is 14.7. Calculate the time it would take for uh, it would take the student working at this rate to transfer twenty five percent of energy from the crisp into mechanical work done. So first, how we can work out? First, we'll work out like what, what is the twenty five? Because as I mentioned, 
like this is a energy which intake, but only 25% is used. So first we'll find 25% of 520 kilojoule. And after finding the total energy for each stretch, when for each time when the device is extended, the student is using 14.7. So we'll find how much, uh, like how many times the student will extend this device or the machine or exercise machine. So we'll know how many, and after knowing how many times it is stretches, then we'll use this relation that, because to work out the time, if 15 times student stretch, he's taking one minute. So how many times like we get stretch, we'll get the value in minutes. So first thing we'll find, uh, what, what is the total mechanical energy? Mechanical energy means a combination of kinetic and potential. So mechanical energy will be 25% of 520 kilojoule. So it will be 25 into 540 and divided by 100, that's equal to 135 kilojoule. So 135 kilojoule is the energy which a student is using to do the exercise. And when he's doing exercise one time, like one time when he stretch, he, it is 14.7 joules. So it is 135 kilojoule or you can say 135 into 10 power 3 joules because so we'll find how many times a student stretch because when he stretches one time he's consuming 14.7 joules of energy. If he want to consume 135 kilojoules of energy how many times did you stretch x times? So cross multiply 135 into 10 power 3 divided by 14.7 so we'll get 9,184 times he will stretch the, the device. And now we'll use a ratio like here for 15, when he stretched 15 times, when he stretched 15 times, he took one minute. So if he stretched the device or the exercise machine for 9,184 times, how much time he will take X? So just cross multiply, like uh, this will be 9,184 divided by 15. That will give us around 612 minutes. So he will take about 612 minutes. Uh, sorry, uh, if we divide just a minute, 9,184 divided by 15. 612, yeah. So 612 minutes, he will take to stretch. Is it uh, clear this one? Next is page number 46. This question, uh, by considering the force acting on the sub submerged line, explain why nylon is less suitable than copper for a deep water fishing. Include a suitable calculation. The both lines have the same cross-sectional area. The density of a salt water is there. The weight of a copper line is given and the weight of the nylon line is given. And we have to say that why, like comparison is there between these fishing lines for a, a deep water fishing. Okay, so both nylon, uh, both nylon and copper can be used to make uh, fishing line. The copper fishing line sink faster than those made from nylon, which makes a copper fishing line more suitable for deep. So what you have to do, you have to compare, like, because uh, we want these fishing line to sink. 
So we want a downward force to be greater than the upward, upward force. Like if the resultant force, the resultant force we want act downward and we want a greater resultant force because the one which will have a greater resultant force will have a greater downward acceleration. So it will sink to a greater depth as compared to the one which is having a lower, uh, like the smaller difference in between the weight and the up thrust that will, because if more up thrust is there, it will, instead of it will sink, it will float. <coughs> So we have to calculate the up thrust uh, experienced by each of this, or ca we can also calculate the net force. So up thrust is equal to density of a liquid. Up thrust is equal to density of a fluid, volume of object, and gravity. Uh, the cross-sectional area is given. So. Using the cross-sectional area as well, like if you consider uh, the length is how much? Uh, weight of 20 meters. So we have the length as well. So up th first we'll find the up thrust on the copper line and then we'll find the up thrust on the nylon line. And both will use the same formula. Up thrust is density of uh, fluid, volume of object and gravity. So density of the fluid, that is the density of uh, seawater, that is 1030. Volume is area multiplied by height. So area is 1.3 into 10 to the power minus 7. And uh, the gravity, that is uh, area multiplied by height. So this was area times the height, the length, which is 20, and multiplied by gravity, 9.81. Because uh, the surrounding water have the same density and we say we consider both have the same volume. So as a result, because when you substitute, we'll get the same value for up thrust for both of them. So that is 0 0.0263 Newton. Now we'll find the net force because the one which will having a greater net force or a downward force will have a greater acceleration. And as a result, when there's a greater acceleration, so it will accelerate downward or it will go deep inside the water. So when we, when we find the resultant force on the copper, that is weight of a copper, which is 0 0.220 minus the up thrust, which is 0 0.0263. And when we find the resultant force on the nylon, that is the weight of a nylon, which is 0 0.0280 minus 0 0.0263. So it, it is obvious like here 0 0.2 minus smaller value here 0 0.02 minus 0 0.026. So we'll have a smaller value for resultant force for a nylon and we have a greater value of a resultant force for copper. That's why it will have a greater acceleration or it is suitable for uh, the deep water fishing. Then the fish becomes caught on the hook and the copper line extended. Calculate the uh, extension. The cross-sectional area is there. The load on the line is there. Original length is there. Young's modulus. So Young's modulus is stress divided by strain. Stress is change over length over original length. And uh, sorry, stress is force over area. And strain is change in length over original length. So you can say Young's modulus is equals to FL divided by delta LNA. The previous answer, okay. The previous answer, we calculated the up thrust. The previous answer, we calculated the up thrust for the both will have the same up thrust. And then we just work out the resultant force, like the weight of a copper line minus the up thrust and weight of the nylon line minus the up thrust. So this will produce a, because it's 0 0.02 minus 0 0.026. So we'll have a smaller resultant force. So smaller acceleration, that's why it will not uh, go deep inside the water. But here for a, a copper line, it has a greater downward force, resultant force. That's why it has a greater acceleration or it is suitable for the deep fishing, uh, uh, deep water fishing.
Then the next part, you just have to, <coughs> you just have to substitute the values. As we have the formula that uh, Young's modulus is equals to force divided by area and change in length over original length. Like this is the formula. We have the Young's modulus. Don't forget to convert the unit. So 129 giga means 10 power 9. Force is there. That is 65. Original length is there, 20. Cross-sectional area is given 1.30 into next power minus 7. And how much extension or change in length, that is delta L. So just make a delta L as a subject and work out the extension. Then page number 57, the last... Uh, With reference to the shape of the graph, describe the behavior under increasing stress. So what is this material, like stress and strain graph, when you see? It looks like the object have deformed, like it is a plastic material undergo a deformation. Initially, when we have a great, greater slope is there, it shows that the object is stiffer. So initially a straight line that it is showing that it is obeying a Hooke's law <laughs> because initially there's a straight line. Then, <coughs> sorry. Then it undergo a plastic deformation as it become curved. So it undergo a plastic deformation and material will not return back to its original shape. So we can say this material will undergo deformation. So it, it can be a malleable or a ductile material. One mark for mentioning it will have the it is obeying a hook's law because straight line, the linear region is there, or stress strain directly proportional, or following the hook's law, or force and extent di directly proportional. Then we have a non-linear region where there's a plastic deformation and object will not return back to the same original length, shape, or size. So this shows that this material is ductile or this material will undergo as it permanently deform when we increase, because here we are applying a tensile force, like force is increasing and under tensile. Tensile stress means, why is you, malleable is not acceptable here because tensile stress means like force acting on unit area to increase the size. If it was a compressive stress, then we'll say it is malleable. Why we did not say malleable here? Because the 